I'd like to start off by presenting just pictures of, of what the precipitation distribution looks like on Earth during the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere summer seasons. Uh, I, I've drawn red boxes around what many people think of as the monsoon regions of the planet. And the point of this plot is really to show you that you have this migration of the rainy zones from one side of the equator to the other side of the equator uh, as you go from one solstice season to the other solstice season. And note that the precipitation uh, is, is highly concentrated uh, zonally uh, in, in longitude uh, in, these, in these monsoon regions. And uh, some of them are, are stronger than others, especially the South Asian monsoon here is, is uh, we have is, is stronger and located further poleward than any of the other monsoon regions. Now those are, uh, that precipitation distribution that you saw uh, is a result of, of highly three-dimensional circulations. But it's common practice uh, and, and it works decently well to, to have a conceptual model to think of the uh, circulation that produces that rainfall distribution in, in two dimensions as a function of latitude and height. And the idea is that you have this continent here located in the summer hemisphere and you have a thermally direct circulation with warm air rising in the summer hemisphere, cold air sinking in the winter hemisphere. And because we're on a rotating planet, uh, the winter hemisphere uh, has trade winds, uh, winds blowing from the east to the west. Those trade winds are reversed to become the low-level monsoon westerlies in the summer hemisphere. And in the upper troposphere, we have, we have uh, easterly wind. Now, as this warm air is rising, it's cooling adiabatically as, as the pressure drops and precipitation uh, forms and falls out. And it's really a, a sort of old view, a traditional view, that this circulation, this whole circulation, is sort of forced by a contrast in temperature between the land surface and the ocean. Uh, you can somehow, you, you can go a little bit beyond that and say, well, uh, this, this uh, precipitation that forms, uh, when the water vapor condenses, you have, you have heat that's released. And it's actually also uh, somewhat common, even, even in the modern day monsoon literature, to, to see statements to the effect of, uh, that, that, that this latent heating associated with precipitation is driving this interhemispheric circulation. Uh, we've, we've come beyond that uh, a, a little bit. Uh, and, and we know now that precipitation, we can't really think of it as a forcing for the large scale flow. It's really part of the solution, if you will. And so what I'm gonna do in the rest of this talk is really present a thermodynamic framework uh, that allows us to think of these large-scale tropical overturning circulations in which uh, precipitation falls out in the ascending branch of the circulation. And I'm, I'm going to start off by uh, really telling you about that framework and how we think, in using it to think about precipitation in the large-scale flow, and then go on and look at several applications. So the the gist of it is, is that when we, when we think of uh, something like uh, the boundary layer of Earth's atmosphere over a desert, we, we have this dry convection, we have this, these turbulent motions in the boundary layer, say that we're over the Sahara Desert, and the temperature profile in the vertical follows a dry adiabat. It falls off at a rate of about 10 Kelvin per kilometer as you go up. We, we don't think of this dry convection as, as sort of a, a heat source. We think of it as simply maintaining this, this vertical profile of temperature in response to some heat flux from the surface into the atmosphere and some radiative cooling of the, the, the column, the atmospheric column. And so the argument is that you can do the same thing with moist convection that moist convection looks very different from dry convection. The upward motions tend to be more concentrated in space the downward and stronger, and the downward motions are weaker. But they are nevertheless these, these turbulent motions that occur in and around clouds that constrain the temperature structure of the free troposphere to be near that of a moist adiabat, which falls off at a, at a weaker rate than 10 Kelvin per kilometer, somewhere closer to six Kelvin per kilometer, but it's variable both in height as well as it varies with uh, what temperature you're at. And the relevant condition, instead of starting off at the surface temperature and falling at 10 Kelvin per kilometer with height, 
the relevant variable to consider at the bottom of a moist adiabat is the equivalent potential temperature, which is a function of both the humidity and the temperature. So it, it's roughly a measure of the energy content. And that, that leads me to my next slide where I'm going to introduce this theta E variable, the equivalent potential temperature. It's, it's, uh, increases linearly with, with a temperature, but it also uh, scales exponentially with the, with the water vapor content. Uh, it it's behaves similarly to the moist static energy, which is the energy that you would get if you added the uh, energy that's in sort of the specific uh, heat of the air multiplied by the temperature, so the energy and the, the internal energy in the dry component of the air. And then you add in the energy that you would get if you condensed all the vapor, the water vapor, to liquid. And then you add a geopotential term. Uh, now this, this convective quasi-equilibrium idea uh, is basically that variations in this low level theta E, this equivalent potential temperature at the bottom of a moist adiabat, look like variations in, in temperature through the depth of the convecting layer. And I've drawn a schematic here for how that, that works, that if you, if you warm or moisten the boundary layer by and, and thus increase the equivalent potential temperature, the theta E of, of boundary layer air, you make the troposphere more convectively unstable. You get a breakout of deep convection, which heats the free troposphere, and you get cold and dry air descending from those convective regions into the boundary layer, just like you do before a thunderstorm. You feel this, you know, this cool air coming down from the free troposphere, these, these gusts. And that reduces the boundary layer theta E, and you end up with a final state that's, that has a higher theta E and a higher temperature than it did originally, but the variation, the change in the temperature of the troposphere and in that of the boundary layer are, are roughly the same. In other words, on, on the previous slide, you just slide from this moist adiabat to a warmer moist adiabat where theta E and sort of some vertically average temperature both move together. Now, this has a particular flavor in monsoon regions because this, this idea of convective quasi-equilibrium, that, that variations in the boundary layer theta E, or energy content, sort of track together with variations in tropospheric temperature, uh, that only works in regions where you're convecting through the depth of the troposphere. When you have these strong overturning circulations in Earth's atmosphere, in the subsiding branch of the circulation, which occupies most of the domain, actually, uh, you suppress deep convection and you, you warm the free troposphere adiabatically, just like you cool it adiabatically in the ascending regions. So the, the area where the theta E of the, the boundary layer is coupled to the free tropospheric temperature is, is limited to these convecting regions that are near the ascending branch of the circulation. In the rest of the domain, your free tropospheric temperature is, is warmer than the boundary layer theta E. And what that means is, th is that in these, when you have a strong thermally direct overturning circulation in the tropics, you expect to see the theta E of the boundary layer air to have a maximum in the same position as the maximum of free tropospheric temperature. And in the rest of the domain, the two are decoupled, but they'll sort of a free tropospheric temperature has a sort of gradual slope. Boundary layer can have more, vari more spatial variability in theta E just because humidity can vary quite easily in the boundary layer. And so this is sort of the simple conceptual model for, for a monsoon circulation, this cross-equatorial circulation, where what convection does is it doesn't drive the flow, it simply maintains the, the tropospheric temperature near a moist adiabat that's tied to the theta E of the boundary layer. And so energy sources, the things that alter boundary layer theta E, become of central importance. I'm going to get to some observations, some actual observations of the real world in a little bit. But first, I wanted to show you results from a simple model to show you how this works when we, when we, when we enforce this idea of convective quasi-equilibrium. And this is sort of results from what you can think of as a two-layer model. We have sort of the troposphere divided into two layers. Air can converge in the bottom layer and diverge in the top layer. And then you have a, a mass flux between the two layers. 
what we're going to do is we're actually going to sort of simulate a monsoon circulation without a continent by starting off by putting in a off equatorial sea surface temperature anomaly as sort of a proxy for the land surface thermal forcing that you would get in a monsoon climate. And so this is, a, this is our, our thermal forcing, if you will, for the circulation. Uh, it's an SST maximum centered at about 25 degrees. That SST imprints itself, essentially, on the boundary layer theta E, which is a solid line right here. You have a uh, northward wind uh, that increases as you go from the cold winter hemisphere in toward this SST maximum. And then, and then the northward wind abruptly decreases in this very narrow convergence zone where you have a large vertical ascent and precipitation uh, upward convective mass flux. The, that, that convection, that deep convection, couples the boundary layer energy content, the theta E, to the free tropospheric temperature, which is shown in this dashed line. And you can see here that the two have these, these maxima that are located in the same exact position. And in out away from that maximum, where you have subsidence, the free tropospheric temperature is higher than this uh, th boundary layer theta E. Now, this is an idea that has sort of um, this is an idea from from a model, a simple model that I've constructed. But but this idea of convective quasi equilibrium of of large scale tropical circulations has been used for for a couple decades now in a, in a number of different contexts. But but really, the consistency with observations hasn't really been that well examined. So that's what I'm going to do is show you a couple slides uh, to to answer the question. Um, are observations consistent with this conceptual framework that we've constructed for monsoon circulations. And what you can see here are uh, the upper tropospheric temperature in black lines, the boundary layer theta E in colors, and it's probably hard to see. Is there any way we can turn off these um, lights that are shining directly on the screen here? Probably not. Huh? Uh, all right, so you can see this uh, black lot, this, this is uh, the black, thin black lines are coastlines. So this is uh, India right here, the Horn of Africa. Uh, the maritime continent is in this region. And you can see sort of Japan up, up, up toward there. The point of this plot is really that the uh, boundary layer theta E has a maximum that's located almost directly under the free tropospheric temperature maximum. And we can go to other regions. I'm only going to show you two for purposes of time. This is Africa right here. You can see uh, West Africa, the Sahara Desert would be up here. This is southern Africa. And boundary layer theta E is the colors, has a maximum directly under the free tropospheric temperature maximum, which is outlined in black. And just like the simple schematic that I showed you earlier, the precipitating region, which is outlined here in white, is sort of located just a little bit equatorward of these thermal maxima, which, which we expect from simple theory. We, we expect the circulation to be sort of driven uh, by these tropospheric temperature gradients. And so you get the maximum ascent where you have a, a, a gradient of, of temperature in the troposphere. So this raises the question of, well, OK, this, this I've shown you what is essentially sort of a diagnostic framework. It, it, we, we know that the free tropospheric temperature and the boundary layer theta E, the boundary layer energy content, have to hang together in this way. but Neither of them are really, we can't think of the boundary layer theta E as being, being set externally. And so the question is, well, what is the ultimate forcing for the flow? Uh, so theta E is really part of the solution. It, it interacts with the flow. It can even be infected by the flow. Uh, one, one approach recently is, that's become popular is to think of tropical circulations being driven by the source of energy into the atmospheric column. So where you're heating the atmospheric column, that's where you tend to have a scent. Where you cool it, you have subsidence. Uh, and this is a, an equation for the vertically integrated. These brackets represent a vertical integral. Uh, moist static energy, so the total energy content when you add in the energy that's stored in water vapor. And if we're thinking about the steady state, sort of a seasonal average, we can set this time derivative to 0. And then we just have a divergence of an energy flux has to be equal to whatever the column energy source is, sort of the surface evaporation, the surface sensible heat flux 
minus whatever you, energy you extract from the column by radiative cooling. Now, an interesting thing is that this also interacts with the flow, as shown by this plot here, from that, which is a plot from that simple model that I just showed you of the surface heat flux, which is shown in the dashed line, and the near surface theta E, which is the green line. And the interesting thing is that the, the theta E has a peak that's actually located poleward of the peak column energy source, the peak surface heat flux, is, which is the peak the column energy source is dominated by the surface heat flux. And that's because this surface heat flux is, is actually interacts with the circulation also. It's elevated by high surface wind speeds uh, and uh, convective downdrafts, which cool the air and allow more, more evaporation to be uh, put to, to occur in this region. So we can see that we have this, uh, it's consistent, we have this thermally direct circulation with ascending air uh, that diverges energy out of this region, uh, diverges the energy that's put into that column by the surface heat fluxes in the radiative field. Now, observations are really consistent with that sort of picture. These are, this is a climatology from reanalysis data, from ECMWF reanalyses for July for the South Asian region. And sh using the same color schematics, the same color scheme, uh, the green line shows the near surface theta E that peaks at about 25 degrees or so. And the dashed blue line that is the, uh, sorry, it says surface heat flux here, but it's actually the vertically integrated source of energy into the atmospheric column. And you can see that it peaks actually well equatorward of the peak boundary layer energy content. And that's because over the ocean we actually have sort of a, a relaxation boundary condition for those of you who are maybe a little more mathematically oriented, where over land we have a flux boundary condition. So the ocean is being sort of, air over the ocean is sort of pegged to, it's, it's constrained to be, have a temperature and humidity that are determined by the SST. Whereas over land we're sort of putting a certain amount of energy into the column by surface heat fluxes. And so things like surface, land surface albedo uh, and the total amount of uh, greenhouse gases in the column become what determines the total amount of energy flux over land. But combined, those can give us these sorts of distributions. And this is consistent with that simple model that I showed you earlier, where we have a, where we have a ascending region uh, that's under this, uh, an ascending region that lies directly over this peak source of energy into the column, and a little bit equator where we have the peak boundary layer theta E, or energy content. Now that's a simple model that I'm going to use uh, to, to look at in a couple different applications and show you that, well, this is maybe, you know, a somewhat uh, esoteric in some ways view of tropical circulations, but we can use it for some very concrete purposes. Uh, this is a, a global view. Uh, I was sort of focusing in on this South Asian region here uh, on previous slides, but now you can see the Americas and Africa where I've plotted again the upper tropospheric temperature and the boundary layer theta E, or actually here it's some moist static energy, uh, in, a, in a global view. Again, a climatology for boreal summer. And you can see that what stands out is really this South Asian monsoon region here. It, it, it has a temperature maximum that, that is, is global in nature. It stretches about halfway around the globe and is stronger than any of the other monsoon regions. And the low level theta E over South Asia is elevated, uh, has a maximum that stretches well inland. When we zoom in on that region, we see that this is, a, again, the Indian subcontinent right here. This is the Tibetan plateau outlined in blue. And you can see that this boundary layer theta E, the maximum lies over this uh, river basin here of the uh, Indus and Ganges rivers. And it sort of runs, has a maximum that runs right up against the topography. You can actually see sharp gradients in theta E uh, that are coincident with the topography. And that really suggests a hypothesis for the role play, played by topography in the South Asian monsoon, that you have these uh, dry desert regions, and, and although the air is hot over these, these desert regions of Western Asia, 
its humidity is so low that that makes the total energy content of that desert air quite low in comparison to this warm but very moist air over, over India. And so the, this suggests that the topography is maintaining these sharp gradients in theta E by preventing mixing of the low energy air over the desert with the high energy air in this moist monsoon region. And that that's what's making this South Asian monsoon so strong and, and located so far poleward. Now that is a, a very different view of, of what drives the monsoon circulation, the South Asian monsoon circulation, uh, from, from what has been traditionally thought. Uh, this is a schematic from a paper uh, by Prell et al. in 1992, but it, it really, uh, I, I used it just because it, it encapsulates in a brief form a theory that goes back to uh, some papers in the 70s and, and even earlier, I think back in the 50s, which posit that the Tibetan Plateau actually is a dominant forcing for the South Asian monsoon, that it's just this elevated land surface, this really broad, horizontally broad elevated land surface absorbs solar energy and because of its elevation and broadness heats the troposphere at mid-levels and creates via a positive feedback with moist convection this giant interhemispheric South Asian monsoon circulation. I'm going to show you some model results that, that, are, that support the idea that I put forth previously uh, two slides ago, which are inconsistent with the idea that the Tibetan Plateau is, is sort of the dominant heat source for the South Asian monsoon. I'm showing you four plots here. One in which, uh, well, the, the uh, top left is, is a climatology of precip that's like what I showed you before. Uh, here you can see the Tibetan Plateau. This is uh, the Asian, uh, Asian coastlines outlined here. Here's Eastern Africa. And note that you have uh, a high precip in this South Asian region. It's, it's very, uh, spatial, very, it's highly variable in space. And this is a, a model simulation from a, a high resolution uh, climate model where what you can see is that we're, we're doing a very good job with this model of reproducing this observed precipitation field. This is actually a remarkably good simulation of South Asian precipitation. There's some deviations here sort of when you get into the Western Pacific, but we're, uh, we're mainly concerned with, with this region in here. And overall for a climate model, which tend to, which tend to sort of smear out uh, precip in these regions quite a bit, this is, is remarkable, remarkably good. Uh, now I'm showing you here on, on the right changes in precipitation for two configurations of that climate model. One is a, a, a model where I've just removed all the topography. So the surface is basically just been made flat. Uh, and you can see that the blue regions signify a decrease in precip relative to this control case. And the red regions signify an increase in precip. And you get a, a very large, horizontally extensive uh, reduction in precipitation when you remove all the topography. This is a, a response that people have seen in a lot of climate models previously, and people have taken this as evidence for the fact that the Tibetan Plateau is, this, is a sort of needed to maintain a strong South Asian monsoon. Now, when you, but, but I've done something a little bit different here, is we've, we've uh, flattened the plateau itself, but we've maintained the orography, this, this sort of narrow band of mountains, the Himalayas, the Hindu Kush mountains, that stretch along that, uh, that, that sort of bound that region of high boundary layer theta E. And what you see is you see that the precip change is much weaker. It's sort of you have, you know, some signal, but it's fairly noisy and you have roughly equal increase and decrease a fairly weak magnitude in this region. And if you look at the uh, winds, uh, this is a change in the low level wind, you see a substantial decrease in the intensity of your monsoon westerlies, your Somali jet. Here you have very little change in the wind in these black vectors. And to return to that thermodynamic view that I used previously, uh, when we look at the theta E of the boundary layer, this is what the control model looked like. You can see this high theta E air stretching over northern India. When we eliminate all the topography, you get a great decrease in 
this thermal maximum when you eliminate all, all the topography. But when you eliminate just the Tibetan Plateau but maintain the Himalayas, you locally reduce boundary layer theta E over the plateau itself, but you perturb the thermal maximum south of the plateau by almost nothing. And when we look at the correlation of boundary layer theta E with the strength of the South Asian monsoon in that model integration that I just showed you, as well as nine different experiments where we perturb the topography and perturb the surface heat fluxes just by shutting off surface sensible and latent heat fluxes in different parts of the domain to get a sense of, well, what, what is the region that's contributing most to South Asian monsoon strength? This is a map of the correlation coefficients over all those nine experiments between boundary layer theta E and South Asian monsoon strength. And you see that the regions where theta E is strongly correlated with the strength of the monsoon is in mostly in this region over northern India here, where the thermal maximum lies. It's, it's no surprise uh, if by this sort of thermodynamic framework that I presented previously. Over the plateau itself, there's relatively weak correlations. Now, this is not to say that the Tibetan Plateau couldn't be important. Uh, it, it would be a strong heat source uh, simply by virtue of its elevation. It's actually known uh, that if you take a, a surface and you increase its height, you increase the temperature that the troposphere equilibrates at over that elevated surface. Uh, but the Tibetan Plateau also has high albedo. And this is a series of, of curves from a mo uh, series of model integrations that were done by uh, Peter Molnar and Kerry Emanuel in the late 1990s, where they calculated the temperatures over a surface as you raised to that surface and as you changed the albedo. So that's what these, these sort of quasi-vertical lines represent, um, surface temperature at different heights. And then as you move to different lines to the left, you're increasing the albedo. And these curved lines are just moist adiabats, where you move up from the, the surface up along a moist adiabat through the troposphere. And the point here is that if you take the, the albedo of the Indian Ocean, if you move uh, up in, in height, yes, you would, you would be much warmer than a moist adiabat drawn up from the surface. But if you reduce the surface albedo to, by roughly the same difference between the ocean and the Tibetan Plateau, you more than compensate for the effects of, of elevation. Now, this is, this is a, a very crude model uh, that was done in the late 90s. And we're actually, uh, Shineng Hu, who's in the audience, is uh, working to re reproduce this in a, in a more modern cloud-resolving model. Uh, but an aside that I'd like to note is uh, that climate models actually poorly simulate the albedo of the Tibetan Plateau. Maybe not all of them, but, uh, but this is a plot of the standard deviation of surface albedo during July and then during January. Uh, across the ensemble of CMIP-3 models. And we could update this with CMIP-5. Uh, I don't necessarily expect it to look too different. Uh, and an interesting thing is that we have a standard deviation across this ensemble of climate models of, of 0.2. That means that in, you know, the standard deviation is, is about 20% of the incoming radiation uh, is being reflected. You know, different differences on that order between these models, which, which is huge. You know, if you think about that worrying about uh, radiative forcings of four watts per meter squared for global change, you know, th these are radiative forcings of tens of watts per meter squared. So I'd like to move on to another application, which is uh, interannual variability of, of climate. Uh, really asking the question, can this sort of simple thermodynamic framework for monsoon circulations help us understand interannual variability of tropical precipitation? And this is a plot from a previous paper by Herling et al., 2006, where they've done a, a very common exercise, which is to create some precipitation index. Here they, they made a precipitation index for the Sahel region of Africa by drawing a box around the Sahel, averaging precipitation within that region, then correlating that index with sea surface temperatures. 
And you get this signal. You find that there's a red here is negative, so they find that there's a sort of a negative correlation between Sahel precipitation and sea surface temperatures in a lot of the southern hemisphere and a positive correlation with precip in a lot of the northern hemisphere. But land, because SST is not defined over land, uh, it is really there's no signal. Uh, and this is unfortunate because when we're talking about tropical precipitations and monsoons, we think of the land surface as being very important. Uh, and so one, what we can do with this uh, framework where we're thinking of theta E, uh, theta E is defined over both equally over both land and ocean. And so what I've done is I've regressed uh, here in the top plot. I've, I've, uh, the coastlines are, are very faint here, but you can see here is Australia, and this is India, and uh, the Indochina Peninsula, and again, and Africa. And I've drawn a box, not around the Sahel, but around uh, the heavily precipitating region in the South Asian monsoon. And uh, John Hurley, who's a postdoc in my group, uh, did this work where he regressed subcloud theta E on this precipitation index for South Asia. And what you get is, is interesting because it shows that you get elevated theta E over this continental India region. Uh, and it's elevated enough that basically the land ocean theta E contrast increases. When you do that just with temperature, this is a sort of surface air temperature, you see that actually during uh, the rainy years, you actually have reduced surface air temperature over India with some elevation sort of north of the monsoon region. Subcloud specific humidity uh, increases over India in the region where it's cooled. So what happens is that during rainy years, the boundary layer is cooler and moister, which is no surprise. But what's interesting is that the two don't just compensate for, I mean, it's, it's, it's um, when we think of, of precipitation simply cooling a surface, we're, we're using sort of conservation of energy, right? We think that some of the energy that's in the dry heat goes into the, the water vapor content. But theta E is, is a conserved variable. Equivalent potential temperature is a conserved variable. It's roughly a measure of the energy content of the boundary layer. So the humidity increases enough that it more than compensates for the cooling of the boundary layer. And this really shows the power of working in this conserved variable framework, where if you, if you look at temperature or humidity alone, you get these noisier signals that don't really show you uh, that we don't really have a theoretical framework to think about how subcloud temperature relates to monsoon strength, because we know that during the rainier years, it's actually cooler than in the wetter years. But this shows that we can use a simple idea of land ocean theta E contrast being enhanced during stronger monsoon years, that that sort of works on an interannual basis. And when we look at other monsoon regions, uh, something somewhat similar seems to hold up, but with some interesting caveats. So this is the same plot that I showed you earlier. Here are the green boxes are the boxes in which I'm defining the precipitation index. And the colors represent the regression of theta E onto the precipitation index within each region. And you can see that here in, in sort of West Africa and Australia, we have, an enhan we have enhanced theta E over the continent during rainy years. And same thing for sort of North America. South America is a little bit more noisy. Uh, but what's interesting is that in contrast with South Asia, this, these signals in these other regions are really confined on the sort of on the poleward edge and even even further poleward of the region of the of the main precipitation, which is inside this box, and that's that's quite interesting because sort of moving on to the fourth part of my talk now, it, it invokes the potential importance of deserts. So this plot that I showed you earlier for the Sahel, we drew a box around the precipitating region, which is outlined in, in blue contours here. And the colors on this plot are, are an estimate of how vegetated the surface is from uh, satellite uh, radiation measurements. And you can see that uh, the plot that I showed you uh, of the theta E regressed onto the Sahel precipitation index showed that during rainy years in the Sahel, you actually had theta E elevated 
over this region, just poleward of the precipitating region. When we saw the plot for Australia, we saw that theta E, boundary layer theta E, was elevated over this broad region of the continental interior of Australia, poleward of this precipitating region. And so that's interesting, because we don't really usually think of, of the thermal, the thermodynamic properties of deserts being uh, related strongly to monsoon rainfall. And, but, but perhaps we should. Uh, th this is a plot that shows what the circulation looks like in a vertical plane over three different monsoon regions. And let's start off here on the, the bottom left, which is uh, northern Africa. And so here the, uh, the summer pole is on the right. And so latitude in the bottom, uh, pressure or height on, on the vertical axis. And what I'm plotting is the uh, meridional circulation. So red vectors uh, denote upward, strong upward motion. Blue vectors denote strong downward motion. And this uh, deep tropospheric overturning circulation is, is our canonical monsoon overturning cell. The black line represents where the boundary layer theta E maximum is. And, it's and it sort of is, serves quite nicely as, as the poleward limit of this strong thermally direct monsoon circulation. But the interesting thing here is that if you look at the strong upward motion, you see that uh, it has a, a sort of shallow branch located poleward of the deep branch. We see this here in Africa. And then when we look at the southern hemisphere, look at Australia and southern Africa, where the summer pole is now on the left, we see this deep monsoon overturning. But then we see, uh, we see shallow ascent poleward of the deep ascent. And this is really just your desert heat low. So this is warm air rising over the desert that lies poleward of the monsoon region and flowing toward the equator, flowing into this deep, moist, uh, baroclinic overturning circulation. And I'm just going to close with that uh, to keep this somewhat short, but sort of summarize uh, in, in this schematic here uh, what I've talked to you about today. And, and I'm going to leave you with this open question about desert circulations. Uh, 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 Ravi Shekhar, who's a, a grad student in my group now, is actually working on this topic for his thesis of the importance of those circulations. But uh, in, in summary, monsoon circulations are, are ultimately caused by meridional gradients in, in solar insulation, right? Uh, but, but over ocean, uh, that's absorbed, uh, and, and there's a great lag because of the great heat capacity of the ocean. Over land, the insulation is communicated quite quickly to the atmosphere by surface heat fluxes. And thinking uh, about the influence of that, that meridional gradient in, in energy source uh, uh, through the boundary layer theta E and the free tropospheric temperature provides this nice framework that we can use to think about monsoon circulations. And I showed you that when you put a mountain uh, between the moist, uh, the warm and moist monsoon area and the desert that lies poleward of monsoon regions, you create this orographic barrier that can prevent this low theta E air from the desert from penetrating into this monsoon region. And that allows this, this boundary layer theta E to increase beyond what it would otherwise be, and this, this thermally direct circulation to become more intense and even shift poleward. Uh, in contrast, when you take that mountain away in the monsoon regions over Australia, uh, Africa, both north and south of the equator, uh, you actually have communication between this desert and the monsoon region. You have this shallow overturning circulation. Uh, that, that can advect dry air uh, from this desert region into the convecting region and shift the theta E maximum and the monsoon thermal maximum toward the equator and decrease their intensity. And we've seen uh, some evidence from observations that, that there's intraannual variability in monsoon rainfall, in the strength of the circulation, in the boundary layer theta E. <coughs> and what I didn't show you is that these... Um, these shallow circulations actually vary in intensity too, that during, during rainy monsoon years, uh, these shallow circulations seem to decrease in intensity. 
And whether that's causative or whether it simply is a co-variation between monsoon strength and the desert heat low uh, is, is a very much an open question and that's something that we're working on now. So I'll just uh, leave it with that and take questions.